Svelde of class. Well, I wasn't really surprised when this proved the most commented on video from last week. I can't think why, but in my history, whenever I have done anything to do with Russian and Soviet ships and all these things, it gets a lot of attention. My theory is that there aren't a lot of sources done on Soviet ships and there is often quite a lot of discussion on it because the vast majority of sources split into two groups. There is the group which goes, yay, Soviet ships, they're amazing. And the group which goes, Soviet ships, they're all terrible. And there's also quite a lot of, and this is something I try to get into the solo class, reading back in history. I... The Soviets developed the Bastion project later on in the period. They designed their ships to defend the Bastions. Those Bastions are about defending their ballistic missile submarines to maintain their areas around their coast and uh, etc. Securing their operational capability. But then people start going, well, they were building Bastions in the 1950s and they weren't. That wasn't how their thinking was at that time. If you want a good example of that... You can have a look through Gorshkov, uh, which I've got somewhere around here, he says. In my Soviet books, I have Gorshkov. Yes, Gorshkov. See, parents, like, okay? This is pretty much the Bible for Soviet naval doctrine. It's far more complicated. The amount of times I read it as if it's simple. But that's because you have a, a strong period where people are presuming it's going to be a short war. And if it's a short war where it's going to go nuclear, you're not going to worry about surface radars going off around the world. You're not at that point. Because, yeah, so they'll sink a few ships in those six or seven days, but <laughs> then the war's going to end. That's pretty much it. You worry about those service raiders in the beginning period, prior to when we have mutually assured destruction occur out. And then you worry about those, uh, start to worry about Soviet surface action groups and wider area forces, out of area forces. Once you start to think, hang on, what happens if the war doesn't go nuclear within six or seven days? And that is a problem. You see, I would make the claim, and I'm doing this all before I start discussing the comments, and definitely I would argue it strongly, that the nuclear scenario of the Cold War truncated a lot of Duran strategy and thinking. It provided an easy out. You didn't have to answer tough questions about infrastructure, supply, or constructing new ships rapidly to make up loss of numbers because there wasn't going to be a long war. And the moment you convince yourself all wars are going to be short wars, you can get away with cutting a lot of spending. You really can. Wars which are short. Well, who cares? Let's be honest. Medical facilities, well, you know, you have enough of them so that peacetime commitments can be maintained and any small wars can be dealt with and it all looks great, but do those really, those medical facilities stand up to the needs of a ma major war? You building that ones? How about logistics? The Vach vaunted NATO logistics system, which was basically there with supply dumps all over Germany and parts of Europe, and the idea was... You could just send a truck and get the supplies and get out. That's That sounds like a great idea. It also sounds like a great idea for an absolute mayhem. If it's not properly coordinated. And if you don't have a lot of trucks and you don't have things resupplying those dumps. Or, well, does that really matter if the war doesn't last that long, though? Because you're never going to have to resupply those dumps because the war will be over. Because we'll all be living in a nuclear wasteland.
so this is the problem. The Soviet Navy, the doctrine of the world, the nations, the theory of fighting that comes out of World War II survives through the Korean War and is really there at the beginning of the Cold War is very different to what dominates the vast majority of the Cold War. And the trouble is... How do I put this play away? When I'm reading histories especially... They're very good on the mid to late Cold War doctrines and the nuclear powers, but they ignore what's going on in the beginning part of it. And they ignore the value of these ships. Enough things, the Stalingrad battle cruisers are cancelled. There is enough, there are enough things cancelled when Stalin dies that if the Soviet Navy hadn't seen, hadn't had a purpose for these ships, the Svodov class would have been cancelled as well. But no, they want them. They want them to do the things they want them to do. They weren't sure about having battle cruisers. They weren't sure about aircraft carriers, frankly, and making the case of it versus the army. But they had a legitimate reason and a very strong case, thanks to the evidence they had from World War II, from World War I, from studying what the Germans had got up to, but also various other doctrines, including the Junocol and a few other little sort of do uh, doctrines which are, uh, you know, get a course and other doctrines which had taken place. They had a good case to make for it. And they did. And that's what those cruisers were for. Right then. So, I'm going to move my microphone a tad. Just a tad. Mainly because it was blocking the problem with the questions. So, Jim the Heliophobe. Heliophobe? Mm -hmm. The Savalon venture of the Gra cruiser Graf Bay wasn't the only example of tying down resources that the Soviets could point to. Turbits basically did F all, but tied down monstrous amounts of the Royal Navy, Fleet Air Arm, and Royal Air Force assets. And the one time she sneezed, the whole convoy scattered and was picked off piecemeal. Turbits was one of the most efficient distractions that severely hampered the convoys destined for the Arctic Russian example that, I argue, may have made an equally deep mark on the Soviet ideas of convoy disruption as Graf Bay. Probably did. And let's be honest, if the resources that were devoted to watching Tirpitz and the other German, because remember there's also Neisenau and Scharnhorst around as well, the other German, uh, German assets available, if the assets the Royal Navy had to distribute to watch them had been able to be deployed to the Mediterranean or deployed to the Far East, there would have been a very different scenario. One of the things I often get pointed out by people goes, well, the Royal Navy doesn't turn up to 1944. And, you know, this basically goes, I can see where this case is going. Yes, the Americans fought, lead, take the lead in the Pacific War. But that's because the British have a force in the Indian Ocean, fighting and lead, taking the lead in the Mediterranean, and taking a lead, the major, I, and when I say taking lead, I don't mean providing all the forces, I mean providing the majority or the ma major logistic support for watching the Germans as well. The Americans concentrate their fleet, quite rightly, in the Pacific. It's very sensible. But think about that. Basically, the German fleet has tied down roughly th a third, quarter to third of the British strength. The Italian fleet is tying down roughly 40%. And plus sometimes and then the Indian Ocean, the British do not are not able to put more than a sufficient force to retain the Indian Ocean, not to advance from it. Britain is one of the is one of the largest navies in the world. It is the largest navy in the world for much of World War Two. The British Empire and the British Royal Navies. And yet and yet all this force is tied down and cannot be deployed to fight one of the biggest enemies in sufficient strength. And that's the power of the surface raiders and their assets and their capabilities and tying down. The fleet in being. They need 
Except that Tirpitz et al. were not surface raiders, they were a fleet in being. Their threat was them being used as surface raiders, let's be honest, there wasn't a fleet in, it wasn't a fleet in being. There's a significant difference between ranging around distant seas and causing dispersion of sea power to counter the threat, and sitting in port looking menacing and causing concentration of sea power to counter the threat. Both are things that inferior powers do when faced with superior sea powers, but don't confuse them. Yes and no. Remember, the threat, the reason they're concentrated, they're a fleet and being, is not because of them coming out and being a fleet that's going to fight a fleet action. It's a threat is that they, when they come out, they would be a surface raider. So that's why you're concentrated to spot them, because so to stop them going out and becoming a surface raider. So it's kind of a hybrid of the two. Both things that inferior sea powers do when faced with superior sea powers, but don't confuse them. Mm, well, let's put it this way. This isn't a German battle fleet. Again, it's not a German... Uh, it's, the Germans might have amassed one, and they, you could have argued that if they better husbanded Bismarck, Tirpitz, Neisenau, Scharnhorst, and managed to build a couple of they could have built a, a battle squadron up to send out. That would have been a very scary thing. But instead, they sent them out piecemeal. So they sent them out of surface raiders. So, yes, as a fleet in being, as in the whole fleet is a fleet in being, and their capability in being, but their capability is not fleet action if they come out, i.e. a la Dutch, at Camperdown, a la the German high seas fleet in World War One. it's surface raiders when they come out. So it is the two. Also remember, the fleet in being would not be response, uh, especially helpful to the Soviets. Where would a fleet in being lead the NATO sea power, to, uh, sea power to be concentrated? European theatre to counter Soviet fleet in being. Where do NATO want their sea power concentrated? European theatre to counter Soviet fleet. You are true on that one, though. The one exception is the Soviet Pacific fleet in Vladivostok. That is useful as a fleet in being, as it distracts the USN and pulls assets away from Europe. Of course, in a general war scenario, the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force and Korean assets are available to use against Soviet Pacific fleet force as well. Yeah, but remember, those aren't available really in the 1950s. The Japanese Navy slowly evolves into what it is today. It ain't allowed to get there quickly, and the Korean Navy is certainly nowhere near what it is today in the 1950s and 60s. They're still recovering from the Korean War, for starters. Le Fier Labriel. Hello. Aaron. While they weren't a big participant in the naval sense, the Soviets paid very close attention to what they could see everyone else doing during the war. Which is the right thing to do if you want to stay a major power. True. Martini Henry. The correct question is always the key to understanding. True. William Cox, that's a... Honestly, I am... I would That would require an entire video to answer that comment. It's off topic, though, as you admit. So I'm going to skip it. But it's a lovely comment. But it's just... Would require an entire video itself. And probably a few slides. Marcus Ryan, Tuck Clark, I hope you got your pen and paper at hand and some recorders. It could have been a very interesting historic event coming in the next few days. Hmm... See, Clark, Soviet strategists were always keen on distraction, so we're always using force multipliers, using them to act as ghosts, so making everywhere a possible point of attack. Mask, as William Cox then points out, Mask Roka, an essential component of any Soviet initiative. It's true. It's true. It's one of those things. And again, the amount of times I have case where people go, but they had the bastions. Go, yes, they have the bastions. But also the bastion doctrine evolves, and the phraseology used around the bastions changes. There is a case of these are areas where are some uh, these are the White Sea etc. These are spaces which we will dominate. To these are spaces where we exclude all others. It changes as time goes on. Mark Harkness, Soviet Navy, we're near. We're here. Get used to it. Also, Soviet Navy, we can't control the sea, but we can cause fits of the sea powers. Also, Soviet Navy. Comrade Stalin likes boats. Also, it seems the Soviets did not share the notion that air power had made navies irrelevant. No. But, again, it's one of those things you get. You get this constant carrying thing of air power has made the surface fleet irrelevant. And, potentially, they will do. But it won't be air power. It'll be space power. Why? Because you're not going to get a 14,000 ton object with all the missiles and all the capabilities that a warship brings into the air. Not in our current technology. 
And by the time you do, you're probably going to be able to get it above into space. In fact, probably going to be able to get it into space sooner than you'd be able to get it sorting out air, because it wouldn't have to fight gravity so often and so much. And that's a far scarier prospect. I have this discussions quite often about what the future of naval forces is and are. It's problematic to presume that you know the future. It's also problematic every time someone jumps up and says that air power will make this thing irrelevant or this weapon, a hypersonics will make this thing irrelevant, etc. Because usually there is a counter to it. Which sounds strange and very bellicose, but at no point in history has anyone produced a weapon for which there is no counter. Now, this is the point usually where someone chucks back at me nuclear weapons. Well, once they go off, yes, you're right, there is no counter. The counter for a nuclear weapon is to prevent it launching in the first place. If you can't do that, shoot it down in the air. But whatever you do, once it goes off, you can't stop it. But if you can stop it going off, which is why people start developing the long-range surface-to-air missiles, why people develop the long-range radars, why people develop all the systems they do, to try and push back against the bomber threat, against the, all these threats, to push them back and to stop them getting through. Would it work? Honestly, I don't know. I wouldn't say out and out they wouldn't work, though. It's going to be a contest. And they're going to fail at points, and they're going to succeed at points. There is this view that warfare, one side wins and the other side loses. And yeah, in the end of the day, one side does win, and one side loses. But usually... A win is made up of a lot of little fights which are wins and losses. And sometimes the side which wins the most little fights isn't the one side which actually wins the war. Usually, but not always. Sometimes you can have a really good skirmish game and a really good small fighting game. Uh, but you lose the big battles and you lose the sieges. Just ask many of the Roman Empire's opponents. They rocked them in the in the skirmishes, but when it came to the big battles and the big wars, Roman logistics usually won the day. JDPT19, thanks always, like to see. Just a side note, I'm now volunteering on Belfast and find myself devouring her deck plans and design as I explore more and where I'm allowed. Cool. Indrex, burn this on, Danny. That, uh, that uh, and Al and James H's, uh, Al Murray's and James H's We Have Ways. I love those. If you're ever going to be up on a board at a weekend, let me know. I will do. Now. Let's see. Master China. During the Cold War, the thought, as I saw it at the time, was that Russian cruisers were meant for short-range power projection with land-based air range, and not as cars riders. I never once saw them so referred to, though I was aware of the German auxiliary cruisers in U-boat war. Were, were there post-1990 documents that surfaced revealing the cruisers might or even have been used as commerce raiders? That's an interesting question to point out, and again, it depends who you're talking to. There was, of course, um, this rather large... Thing. But, documents I referred to were Admiralty Archive translations of Russian documents from the 50s. To be sure, the perception of them as the close range thing is to do with them being more comfortable, tar that being a more comfortable target for NATO to focus on. Soviet naval doctrine, especially Gorshkov and Soviet diplomacy, meant there were always multiple units operating far away from home. This on the Indian Ocean Squadron formed in 1968. May interest you? There's a link in the comment. Um, basically, the Soviet Navy is often portrayed as being very focused, but the reality was they always had a multiplicity, a multiplicity of capability, and a firm understanding that a few units in critical places in the world could have an outsized effect on the ability of the NATO to focus the entirety of their efforts in the North Atlantic and Europe. 
especially when you start thinking about a longer term conflict. It's during that period when you're thinking just short term that everything gets short range and local and that's all we're going to think about because it's only going to matter what's a short term conflict. Yeah, I'm aware that long-range patrols for diplomatic purposes, submarines also so used, but I'm also speaking of warfighting doctrine, i.e. combat. I haven't any direct evidence of commerce raiding strategy in Gorshkov's mind or his submarines. What's that one? In much of his work, it's implied, especially in his discussions of force and multiple low factors. As for my plates and stuff, while Western access to Russian archives was always interesting, easy access to political stuff, defense and security was very difficult. And so mainly we are going from documents cut recovered by intelligence services. But it certainly seems to in those to be a consistent focus of a small number of assets, basically anything which was caught outside the wall in a war scenario, was to turn surface radar. Seems to be the gist of it, and this effect ves this affected vessels and crews chosen for the diplomatic patrols. I.e. you are sending ships out for diplomatic duties. What is their wartime role? Their wartime role is to do this. Okay, we better be prepped for it. And that's what they were. I always wonder, when people start talking about the Soviet Navy, how they have described them to them just such a simple strategy. They really do put the Soviets down and go, it's just this, 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 they would just do this. And the thing is, the vast majority of the conversation goes that way, but that's also because the vast majority of the texts seem to go that way. And... It goes back to a point a few years ago where someone was telling me the Soviets were Klingons and NATO was the Federation. And if you look at the Klingons in Star Trek, yes, in the books they get far more complicated and in some of the movies they do actually get a decent run, but in a lot of the television shows they are point and attack basically their enemy charge yeah they have a cloak so they can charge out of the cloak and attack you and then get really close and the reason they have the cloak really is so they can get close and they can board your ship and attack and it's all lovely fighty 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 but they're not really given much in terms of strategic competence it's dangerous yes I have always felt that Soviet logistics was a weak spot. And, to be honest, Russian logistics today is even more of a weak spot because, how do I put it, the Soviet dictatorships had a way of making sure, well, a way of making sure logistics um, worked. You either got the logistics to work or you weren't breathing. Uh, it, and your family probably will charge for the uh, lead. But, um, life happens. And that's the case. The Soviet Union is no more. We're dealing with modern Russia. Modern Russia is just as thinking. They might not be always able to deliver on it. That's the trouble. People equate what they deliver with what they think it for, think through. You can be a lot smarter than what you can deliver. Some of the best strategic minds I've had the joy of having discussions with at you know various NATO things I've been invited, I've managed to wank, finangle and wangle in a ticket. Some of the best people I've talked with are people from nations which have nowhere near the geostrategic capability reach. I remember once sitting down, and this was actually before I even got to my PhD level. This was actually while I was back at school. Um, I was sitting there chatting away with, in outside of an exam, I was helping with organising exams for the day, their music exams. I don't know how it was. A, it was a Saturday gig, and I was getting paid, so I was my. One of dads come, came in, chatting over him. He was a Dutch officer doing a PhD at through King's College London in geostrategic thought. 
incredibly smart. And we were talking away, and his PhD was about how you sort of deploy assets around the world to match issues and deal with issues and evolve things. And the assets we were talking about how you deployed around were carrier groups, were nuclear submarines, were full range forces, things which even back then the Dutch didn't have. So that's people who don't have the equipment, still have the brains and still have the capabilities of working out how to deploy these things very well. Again, just because they're let down by their baser demons, in some cases when we're watching them, don't make the mistake of presuming the Russians, the Soviets, were any less thinking than we were. Never presume your opponent's dumb, basically is the motto. They'll defeat you twice as quickly if you do. Run. Does the West keep up its battleship, battle cruiser, and heavy cruiser infrastructure if the USSR went full bore on their construction of the Soldovs and Soldovs' successors? If 40 Soldovs appeared, then I. Well, a Vanguard was kept around, and as I discussed in my own article, Vanguard was kept around. Um, various other things were kept around. In order to do, so, in order for it to, to sort of act as a uh, counter Svoldov for a while, I think if it's more interesting if the Stalingrad class get completed. If I have this feeling that if those battle cruisers are built and the Svoldovs are built, and you suddenly have these full groups growing around, and let's be honest, the Stalingrad class. Battlecruiser, otherwise known as Project 82, would have had nine 12 inch guns. So, not the most powerful thing in the world. What do I think would have happened? Well, I wouldn't be surprised if the Alaskas as well as the Iowas stuck around in that case. For Britain, it becomes more complicated because all of our battle fleets going. We're slowly get. Uh, they've worn. I've been worn out with war or anything. Uh, all these things. You might see Anson and Howe stay a bit longer, but they're not really fast enough. A Stalingrad class battle cruiser was supposed to be able to do thirty-five and a half knots. Even Vanguard. would not be that much help versus that. And even the Iowas, as good as they are, wouldn't be that much help against that. They're 30 knot sort of plus ships, but they're not 35 knot ships. The question is, do the British dust off some old designs? What do they build? Do they build 14 inch guns? Well, if you've got something which has 9 12-inch guns, the British could have built something with 12 14-inch, use that quad turret again. They could have gone for a triple turret with 15-inch. They could have... I have this feeling, and this is going to sound strange, but my feeling is, honestly, if the Russians had come out of World War II putting more effort into building their capital ships and their cruisers and had more quickly built seen projects on like the battle cruisers going off and all these things I think you would have the Maltas completed and I think the British probably not a Lion or anything like that but probably would have mm, built a Vanguard successor and I have this feeling they would have been they'd have looked at the guns they had available and the guns they were building and what they could have done 
So it would either have been 14 inch or 16 inch guns. They might well have decided, well, hang on, what can we do with the turrets from Nelson and Rodney? Because if you think about that, that's nine guns on each one going around turrets. And if you can get the mechanisms off and you can redo the turrets and use them for something, you could make a battle cruiser using those turrets. And that would be something which would be powerful enough to track them down. And you probably want a couple if you were the British. Um, that's my theory, anyway. That's what I think would have happened. I think you'd have also seen more cruisers built. Um, there is an interesting discussion I've had with Drac about the Svaldovs, which was there was this idea at one point when they were getting rid of Vanguard that, you know, a one that a town class could go one on one versus a Svaldov. And we were both sort of going, we prefer not to, prefer to have a few darings properly as backup, but that's the tearing class gun and torpedo destroyers. But um, yeah, they, they, they might be okay. And then there's the fear, there's someone going, well, we think one town class could take on two Sveldovs. Oh God, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Whichever Bright Spark wrote that was definitely um, smoking something. They were high as a kite because that's the only way they could justify one, one town class taking on two of these. Two of these would massacre a single town class. Two of these wouldn't massacre a Vanguard, but there again, Vanguard would be the most expensive walnut cracker around at that point. Carl, were six inch guns really the best choice if purposes were intimidation for the residents? Wouldn't eight or nine inch guns on eight or nine eight inch guns be even more impressive on the same displacement? Well, first of all, you have the fact that what guns can the Soviet Union build, they can build a six-inch gun. But also, they were building these as part of an overall cruiser program, originally. Stalingrad class battle cruisers, as mentioned already, on, also under construction, so they made sense. And in a world where battleships were disappearing fast, and even heavy cruisers are going, the six-inch cruiser is king. And basically, if you're looking for something that's impressive... Most politicians and most people who are not naval will are not navally inclined or information or have the information on it inclined will look at those guns and go, big guns, lots of them. And that's twelve six inch guns. That's a lot of firepower. If they carried twelve eight inch guns that would have been very scary. There are certain American cruisers which probably would have been had a lot more funding sent their way and there were more of them built at that point. And it's, it, it's something to think about. It's honestly something to consider. If they had been 12, 8-inch guns, they would have been up there again on the firepower, they'd have had to be slightly bigger to maintain speed and capabilities that they wanted with 12 and 8 inch guns. Um, what impact would it have had? It could have changed which cruisers get finished off by the British. Because again, 6 inch cruiser is a great idea unless you're facing something which has got 12 8 inch guns. Then six in, 12 6 inch guns don't match in against 12 8 inch guns. 12 6 inch guns match in against 8, eight, eight, eight inch guns in terms of volume of fire. But I'm, I do remember there are videos where I've done this showing this table off the firepower volume. And yeah, that's an interesting spreadsheet to work through. I feel a brill. A eulogy for this class, the Glorious Swan Song, the traditional gun arm cruiser, to an extent. Uh, not going to common politics, but this is uh, only. Uh, but not only is this one of the best-looking six-inch cruisers ever built, they're also and quite comfortably the best, the best balanced. Yeah, they're definitely post-treat era. Hans Brugger. Hello, Hans. The Serbov class is also a ship designed for the Soviet experience at the hands of foreign cruiser courses, as I tried to, as it tried to sustain nationalist Spain by seeing the face of de facto blockade by Western European powers. Um. Well, no, Soviets. It wasn't nationalist 
Spain, it was Republican Spain the Soviets were trying to sustain, uh, and Britain and France were sort of supporting them with the Republicans and turning a bit of a blind eye. Nationalists were the were um, sort of being supported by the fascist powers. A spell of escorting merchant convoys or operating in support of Soviet and merchant marine decisively raises the bar of any post-war power seeking to carry out a Spanish war a civil war style non-intervention patrol, i.e. blockade in everything but name, only in response to future Soviet intervention in support of post-war and revolutionary movements. Svelov seems designed from the outset to be able to bully pairs of trade protection cruisers such as Leander's in subsequently grey conflicts such as non-adventure patrols and would present a dilemma in resources and escalatory potential to any Western power attempting a repeat of such action. Turns out there weren't enough to make a difference in Cuba, but I'm sure the intent was there, rattling around the original design justification. Yes, I'm fairly sure their naval diplomacy part was understood. Now, Ian Walter, my understanding is that the doctrine of preservation of strategic counter-strike assets resulted in the requirement of the Kiev class. True, the Kiev class. Their intended role was to send a piece of a service task force sent to, uh, sent to protect the SSB and Bastions in the parents and Octos, Octos, Octos seas and assigned to northern Pacific fleets. According to a few Vistal fighters to see off Orion's Act and heavy anti-ship missiles and anti shrapnel warfare armament. The air group was primary rotary wing. There was no doctrine calling for a blue water air combat task force for these ships. You're talking about the Kiev class, not the Svoldovs. There's about mm, 30 years of difference between them, but I'll see where you're going. It was the same role as originally envisaged for the Moscow class helicopter cruisers, which were by all accounts awful ships. They were absolutely terrible. And the last four were cancelled and replaced by more capable Kievs. Other than that, there was an offensive doctrine to implement strategic maritime interaction, but operationally it mainly involved submarine v VMF ASM carriers. I'm not sure the saturation concept of overwhelming a USN uh, carrier nuclear battle group amounts to a doctrine, but as an operational technique, it could play a role in either of the strategic objectives. Okay. Alright. I'm seeing where you came from. I think you're talking about the strategic doctrines question I put at the end. Uh, you're talking about the Bastion doctrine, which is the late World War, II, uh, late Cold War doctrine, and saturation bombardment, uh, which was coordination and total strike uh, doctrines, which would involve them using submarine launch missiles, surface action group launch missiles, perhaps as well stuff from the Kiev. Who knows? Depends if it's there. And coordination with strategic bombers launching their missile force as well. Um, Red Storm Rising gives a good example of this. Basically, the entire reality of Aegis is that's what the Americans developed to try and prevent that happening, an overwhelming scenario. But the whole point of the overwhelming scenario is it's basically a mathematical scenario. And it draws off earlier doctrines. So the torpedo doctrine, which the British were uh, British were reacting to, in, at the Battle of Jutland, where you had a mathematical certainty that if you launch a, if a certain number of torpedoes are launched at you, the odds are if you're in a densely enough packed force, you will lose this many ships. So that's why you turn around, because yeah, maybe you can afford to lose those ships today, but can you afford to have lost them tomorrow? It's basically the same with the Soviet Union and their doctrine and what they're thinking of. In that, the idea is they launch enough missiles at you that you, they exhaust your missiles and your countermeasures and then the missiles come blasting in, whatever remains. It's the same as we're looking at today. When we're talking about drone warfare and all these things... The ultimate thing is the idea that you can launch something which is a cheap enough asset at things which will co uh, which will cost so much to defend that basically you make them defenseless because you wipe out their defenses and then go in and take them out. That's why all the investment in rail guns, lasers and all those other things, electronic weapons, is going on because if you achieve those electronic weapons... If you can start to knock out 
even just the subsonic cruise missile, the subsonic and maybe even the low sonic cruise missiles and um, anti ship missiles and the drones with those lasers. Then you change the name of the game because suddenly your missiles, well, I don't have to worry about using my missiles to focus in on those other threats. I can use my missiles to focus in on the threat that is the hypersonics. And that then changes the cost alignment for the hypersonics because your whole thing was launching a couple of hypersonics into that mess is going to cause them a nightmare. Well, hang on, now their life is made easier and now your hyper couple of hypersonics are versus what, their 30 surface-to-air surface missiles? And how many of those will they launch to engage? Maybe three, three for each target? The odds are they cause enough damage that they take out the hypersonic at range. So how many hypersonics do you now have to launch to guarantee a hit? Which hypersonics are not exactly cheap missiles themselves, and their launchers aren't cheap, and their systems aren't cheap, and you can see where those things are because they're big. That's the problem. The round crews. Hello. You think it'd be feasible if any of the uh, unit unbuilt solar cruisers to be turned into independent Saipan Sar cruiser to light carrier conversion? They're pretty much a, still a bit under the Montreux convention if they want to get out of the uh, Black Sea, if they're built in Miko of. You could do something with them. I'm not sure how good it would be. But you could do something with them. They're big enough. Well, long enough. You could do something with them. P-1900 pilot. It's the crew that makes a ship. Without it, a ship is an inanimate metal object. True. Great, okay, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Clark, and my coach, Dr. Clark, I seem to remember you commenting on a previous video about the RN plan to deal with them. Something about, well, we'll just have to run in and torpedo her then. Um, I don't think I said that about the Svaldovs. I think I said that about... But I think that said that was basically the plan of the Royal Navy Destroyer Force for whatever they were dealing with. Assuming that this is the one you do uh, do the comments or video on, would you be able to expand on how NATO planned to deal with them and whether they are in your and had different strategies and how these strategies have changed as time went on? The strategies do change. It starts off with, well, A, the British order the Buccaneer. And that's to try and provide a strike capability. But that takes about mm, a good decade and a half to deliver. There is a debate as to when it's really viable, and I would say the Buccaneer is really a strong capability about 1964-65, and it started work on about roughly 1952. In the meantime, you start off with you have daring classes having torpedoes and other ships which have torp destroyers which have torpedoes. That's always the policy of dealing with bigger ships is to stick a torpedo on them. Uh, you have Vanguard hanging around, and you have the various light cruisers. And again, I went into this in uh, the paper, which I linked to at the bottom in the description of the um, of the of the video. That's pretty much it. They have these ideas, and they're going to go with them. But it's it's not really an easy point for them. Frederick Mills, the Royal Navy attitude, in, indeed, that of the Navy South Foreign Office was to publicly dismiss such threats as the Soviet and Argentine Navy as people not known to have much deep water fighting history or success. Um, not really. Uh, the Foreign Office, maybe, but not the, not the Naval Staff. Public attitude, potentially the Foreign Office. The Soviet Navy performance in World War II appeared to have been poor and shown little desire. Not really, again. The desire to engage in aggression intent. Um, I'm not sure who you've been reading in terms of history, but trust me, speaking as a person who's doing some videos on the Soviet Union, study their navy quite a lot. They do a lot of engaging um, with a lot of aggression and intent whenever they can. The trouble is that a lot of their fleet is not in a really good place to do it. Um, submarines they might develop and use. Surface ships were thought unlikely to be used beyond the way Scandinavian used coastal defence monitors. No. I, I, I'm not sure where you're getting this from. Um, if raiders and indeed servos were being deployed in the South Atlantic on the ocean for presence or prize, it was thought that one servos could have been handled by a couple of daring destroyers. The three main four or five, five turrets, after all, uh, three more shells, pound, uh, three more shell pound per minute 
uh, than the free turret town or colony. I literally wrote the book on the Daring class destroyers, and I don't think at any point were they thinking that they wanted to have a couple of Daring class destroyers versus a single Svoldov. Um, not a couple. Maybe they thought uh, four in terms of half a, a you know a standard flotilla at that point of four, possibly, but two no. Um, I can see where you're coming from. The Daring was superior to a town, of course, only at medium range against destroyers and short range against lightly armoured British star cruisers. Not something like sort of true. The RN fought a couple of Type 41 diesel frigates, a steer, a steer like diesel destroyers with two mark, 4.5 marks inches. Could we be out of adequate to counter on the 959 South America station? No, they didn't. That was presence mission only. They weren't there. They weren't there to counter the world of in a war fighting scenario. They were there to do a presence mission scenario. There is a difference. Of course, even the ever optimistic Iron Staff realised two soldiers were a problem, rather lacking a non-USN solution in 1954-55. Um, there's this thing called Vanguard going around, and there are the British do have their own aircraft carriers at this point, and their own strike groups, and they have town class and the multiple and that sort of use. If you send Baltimore or Essex or New Forestals on the side. Game over. If not, it was a problem. Uh, no, the British do have their various aircraft carriers themselves going around as well. That's basically the trouble, though, with folders, is that you have to call in a carrier battle group. Or you have to try and get a pack of cruisers together, or you have to have a full flotilla of destroyers. Probably daring class, but probably battle, or possibly battles as well. If not, it was a problem. And it was. In 1954, Winston Churchill twice refused to join Azana and Secretary of State John... John Forrester Dulles in Declaration of War on Vietnam. Vietnam in 1954. Okay, I've just been checking. Because in 1954, it was still a French-led operation in Vietnam. And it was called Indochina. And I don't think they invited the British to declare war over it. Because who are you declaring war over? Because at that time, Indochina was still controlled by the French. So who are you declaring war against? You can join and send forces to assist the French, and the Americans do send bombers to assist the French in assisting in fighting in Vietnam in 1954. But no. Um... And, yeah, Operation Musketeer, which was the Suez campaign, wasn't disrupted by harassment by the U.S. fleet. The U.S. fleet didn't get involved. The Royal Navy and the French Navy were combined and joined operations doing that, and they got pulled back because, basically, they didn't achieve it quickly enough, as I've been over again before. ...force in an Allied structure as existed between America, France, and Britain at that time, without America knowing. And if Britain had managed to achieve, the Suez, if the Suez Canal operation had achieved the decisive overthrow of the leadership of Egypt quickly, then I'm fairly sure the Americans would have tacitly supported it. But as it failed to achieve things in sufficient, in, at sufficient pace, and then became a mess, the Americans then capitalised on it in a different way. Um, you're, you're f I'm not sure you're getting this where you've got these sources from that are saying this to you, Frederick. Um, it's yeah. For starters, the British do not operate. The daring class, uh, yes, one of them gets deployed to the Far East to cover for some cruisers when they come, out, cruisers when they deploy back. But that's not because they're considered better, better than them. It's because the cruisers need to be repaired, and they need, they're mostly World War Two vintage, and 
they need to be refitted and heavy maintenance, and the daring class is the only thing big enough that's free available to fit the fill the role. And it's been designed to fill the role when needed to in emergence, in sort of in in crisis scenarios like the tribals were. Man nine. Um. Yeah, there's there's the basically any if it's a two svelte ofs, then it's calling in the British carrier. For if it's the American, and if it's, and that's what you have them around for. This is what Britain has the fleet carriers it does in the 1950s for, to be called upon. They have things like Victorious, etc., hanging around for that purpose. Eagle, Ark Royal. Uh, Fred oh, good lord. Did you Frederick. Okay, so. Magnuch, if in the pre missile age the RN had decided to build a counter to Thurlows, what do you think it would have looked like and what modernizations would it have received as the time passed? I'm assuming they stayed and served as long as the Thurlows would. The counter, as I said quickly, was like a buccaneer. It was the buccaneer. The link in the description goes in details on this. Ah, Frederick. Right then. The entry into service of the 14 Solos, 1951 to 55, and five of their predecessors in 1950 to 51, and say five of the earlier 7.1 inch Kirov class crews, means the RN continued to operate and refit a fairly large frontline cruiser fleet of 16 to 20 cruisers into in 1950 to 55 until the end of the immediate Korean War. U.S. hydrogen thermonuclear capability and final reproduction a replacement of piston prop fighters bombers with sea venoms and Seahawks 155, which gave the at least a daylight good weather strike capability for the uh, Royal Navy Light Fleet and Eagle and Ark from 1955. Okay, great. Uh, Frederick Miles at uh, Doctor Clark. There was a little possibility of Buccaneer S2 being ready in time to uh, to be a relevant counter to the Svelte of in a likely short or shorter war. Yeah, that. That's why I wrote it in my article. Um, I have discussed it first. And the uh, Buccaneer project was in some ways a copybook and successful deployment with the set, uh, without the setbacks expected by Prime Minister Churchill. It was in fact a major opponent of the Buccaneer, which he expected to suffer cost overrun unlike new aircraft carriers tugged down predictable financial costs. Churchill wasn't Prime Minister by this point. Um, it was... Eden? Around that, at this point. Nevertheless, it took from 1952-56 for the S2... Uh, 1952-66 for the S2 Buccaneer to actually appear on Victoria, Hermes and Eagle. At exactly the point the British government decided to scrap the Iron Carrier Fleet. Um, S2 is really in service from 1963... Uh, 64-ish. S1 gets into service before that. Um, that's the first Buccaneer to enter a service. And yes, I do agree they require changes, but, you know. My response was, hey, Frederick, please go read an article uh, an article mentioned in the comment and link to above and here. I hope you think you'll find it interesting. Frederick then responds, I have read your original Naval History article on Solar Club several times years ago, and your more recent take, pre-Ukraine, pre-2020, invasion of the contemporary role of Russian ex-Soviet cruisers. Moscow is, of course, now at the bottom of the Black Sea, the inevitable fate of a 40-year cruiser in the combat in Black Sea. That hasn't been upgraded properly, yes. How a much better refitted Varag, aged 25 in 2014, may, from close study, have actually taken MH370 off the Vietnamese coast in the opening of the 2014 war. I haven't seen any evidence to suggest that myself, okay? Uh, you're assuming a long-range SS-300 hit has a declaration of intent by the Russian Navy to stop high-tech transfer of uh, Motorola Freescale chip tech used to silence Chinese SSN who were in dispute with the Russians at the time. The Vietnamese Admiral say it was a hit from a gem manpad, maybe MH370 was 6 rather than 8 miles hard, on deck of a kilo. I assume a full fight Russian. I haven't... I've done a lot of study on various things. And honestly, whilst 
I do realize there are many theories about what happened to MH370. And there are many potentials for what happened to it. So far, as far as any evidence, and as I said, I've studied a lot of things, I've, I've gone into a lot of work on it. And I have to admit, on the MH370, that's always been something I've been looking into because, well, when it happened in 2014, my dad was still right around and was kind of interested in it and trying to figure out what was going on and what had happened. And where it had gone, because some of the ships which he'd been involved in the creation of were being used for the search. At no point have I seen any source which I would consider a, how do I put this politely, a reliable source which is not looking to make evidence fit a pre-arranged pre conclusion. Claim that. And trust me, there are people I have worked with and people I know who will look for any information to try and look for a spot Russian culpability. There are some good friends. I know their biases, though. And I watch it when it's done and giving me information. In reading, I note you comment that the RN decided on multiple responses to Soviet Navy cruisers and capital ship projects. I suppose the Commonwealth light fleet carriers and present tra press transfer by Mount Bonov, Royalist, and Diadem to New Zealand and Pakistan were part of that, as was the stillborn 5 inch auto RN cruiser destroyer proposals. Mmm. Well, not really. Um, and still bought a 5 inch automatic. Mm, there's a four and a half inch automatic which we're looking at and six inch automatic and three inch automatic five inch auto there are people who suggest the British were looking at it but they never seem to really go into it uh, one would have thought the USN fourth group Juno class cruisers ordered um, but not built in 1945 with twin manually loaded five inch 54 caliber turrets uh, much was intended for Ma Montana battleships and used in the French De Grasse and Corvette 1954 for the Iron was possibly just as effective as the RN 5 inch order, or the Mark 23 6 inch or standard RN 4 or 45 Mark 6. Yes and no. The British were looking at certainly for capabilities. And the Tigers are pretty much part of it as well. The 6 inch autos, the 3 inch autos, they're part of that there. And I think if the 6 inch auto had proved more successful more quickly, I think part of the trouble with the 6 inch auto is that they're trying to do everything with it, use it as an air weapon as well as an anti ship weapon, and all those things, and that does create a lot of more complexity. But it would have been, a, it would have been certainly if there had been more Svaldovs produced and more quickly produced, I think you would have seen something done with that. And I think probably you would have seen some sort of... Well, the Tigers, of course, had twin 6, then twin 3 inch sort of systems. Um, fore and aft. I think you would have probably seen something turn up which would have had 8 or so. Twi uh, 8 or so 6 inch guns in 4 twin turrets. And probably 8... Three inch guns in four twin in four twin turrets as well with its sort of six six forward and then two for uh, a three inch either side and then the same at the stern and maybe even a helicopter position in the middle. The British do keep like returning to the helicopter position in the middle. Uh, the USN found during the Vietnam War in. GFS, that the single auto um, 5 inch 54 finally got working properly in Charles of Hiddens. They're just about a good or even much better in ranging impact and particularly accuracy as legacy World War II Cleveland Cross Cruiser 6 inch turrets on the missile conversions. More than likely, because no one had invested enough in that in upgrading the 6 inch to the same level as the 5 inch. If you apply the same technologies and same upgrades you and efforts you're putting into the 5 inch and developing that into an auto system into a 6 inch and the same commitment, you could have, well, have had an automatic 6-inch. That would work, rather than the auto 6-inch they did produce. Ooh. 
Then there is the stillborn 18,000 ton free uh, ton attempted Minotaur class cruiser being proposed in 1956-57 uh, with two twin Mark 26 6 inch twin autos and four auto 3 inch 70s, uh, 984 3D radar and sea slug as a decoration on the back. Hey! As I believe both Sea Slug and Sea Cat are useless. Sea Slug was too inaccurate and too likely to disintegrate a few miles down the track to actually be used as a nuclear warhead or against ship or land targets. So the missile cruiser was actually the last RN uh, cr gun cruiser, but it's arguably for, although unrealistic, Project had zero chance of approval by Gretton, Manban, and Sandys, that four of the big cruisers were better than the ten county general uh, guided missile destroyers. Okay. All right. I'm not sure I can agree with you on the Sea Slug and Sea Cat. As, uh, y yes, if we look at and compare them to modern missiles, they're not that great. If we compare them to other missiles at the time, they were getting there. As for approval and whether or not it would get through, again, I think it depends on the context of the time. It depends on what's going on. Mountbatten was very, very cautious politically when it came to naval, naval spending and didn't want to push the boat out and didn't want to show favouritism. So he would only put things forward if they could be justified. He was actually a fairly good politician, though, when it came to certain things. He, I'm not sure about him as a naval officer and a strategic thinker, but as a politician, he's fairly good. So if he can be persuaded of things, he can often get the funding for it. I also doubt if Mountbatten is but if the case had been made and the capabilities had been there I think they could have pushed for it I think the trouble is you go from an era where everything is very much naval focused and then you're withdrawing from Empire especially post 1956 that sort of accelerates. Yes, it's turning into the Commonwealth, but that's a different type of commitment. And you also have the Central Front as the dominant thing. And especially whilst you have, and I've talked about this several times in the video, this sort of short war doctrine. This idea that any wars are going to be quick and then nuclear, which absorbs so many people and so much thinking, that a lot of decisions which we find very hard to rationalize and go, they must have been dis doing this or weak or they must have been uh, not acting against the British interests or in their own interests or making very these, these short-sighted decisions from our perspective actually make sense when you start to think of the war's only going to last six, six days before it goes nuclear and everything gets blown up. What's the point? What is the necessity in building a proper counter to a Svoldov class or maintaining carrier battle groups if your only thing if your only focus is a nuclear war versus the Soviet Union if you are being so myopically focused that all you are thinking about is the central front in Europe and nuclear war that's likely to occur within a week of war, war starting there you are not going to think about wars in the South Atlantic. You're not going to think about what you need for ships in the Indian Ocean. You're not going to think about what you might need to assist, I don't know, Australia in a conflict against or aliens. It, it doesn't matter. And we have to think about it as a rather strange era because at no point in British history has such a focus lasted for so long in any nation's history. There have been points in history where nations have got so focused on one threat that everything has gone into preparing for that threat and everything else is whatever's most expedient until they've dealt with that threat. And the Cold War is kind of like that. Everything gets focused in on that threat for a long time. It's not good strategy. It's not good geostrategy. Definitely not. 
It seems, I don't know any Soviet doctrine, but these cruisers suggest the feature of it. You mentioned Buccaneer and Intruder being a response to them, being fairly hefty aircraft. They take up plenty of hangar space. Uh, with Sword of Class running around NATO, can't wake, wake carrier groups towards ASW large Tuplos flying around with early cruise missiles, number of fighters can't be reduced, so I see Sword of Class cruisers as a part of a multi-spectrum threat that reduces anti-submarine warfare assets on carriers and prey on lone anti-submarine warfare destroyers free at score that's in addition to the commerce rating or cake, or cake and vodka missions. Hence the uh, surface anti-submarine warfare assets into mutually, uh, the surface uh, anti-submarine warfare assets into mutually supporting groups, reducing the ocean they can cover, thus leaving subs plenty of space to play. There is certainly an argument you may, uh, which is true that you're making. If you can force your opponent to deal with more than one threat, you put them in a box. Again, the lessons the Soviets had from World War II. Once the Germans were down to a single axis threat, anti submarines. Yes, those submarines were getting better. Yes, they were producing better, faster, nastier submarines. That people write all sorts of wonderful papers about how dangerous they'd have been, how devastating they'd been. But they were still only one threat. They basically allowed the Allies to focus their systems on anti submarine warfare, to focus their organization on their ships on anti submarine warfare, to focus the structure of their convoys on anti submarine warfare. That's what they had to focus on. That was their threat. So yeah, it's a big threat. It's a scary threat, but it's one threat. It's kind of like if you're in a fight. You know, you're you've got a scary person coming to attack you. Yet the floor in front of you is made of lava. And yes, they're bigger and scarier than you. But they can only approach you on one line of attack down a narrow pathway. If they get to you, they're going to clobber you. But they're going to come down one narrow pathway and you can pick how you prepare yourself for it. Don't know about you, but i get a big spear. <laughs> Possibly, you know, possibly a bow and arrow, or a bow and arrow, or something like that. Maybe a gun, but probably a big spear. Because in that scenario, I'm presuming they're not allowing you to have ranged weapons. I didn't say it at the beginning, but yeah, it makes it more fair if you're facing a big hulking person and they can smatter you to pieces. Eh, you know, you have the big spear. You can hold them at bay. But. Let's say you're in a scenario where you've still got that spear. But now there is also someone who can leap across the lava involved. And they have little pots that they can jump around from and jump at you because they're air attack. And there's also another person with a spear on their side, who's coming at you from another angle. So you've got them coming from that side, the big person who you worry about the first time coming at you from the front, now they're in their axis, and then now they're in their axis, and then you've got this hopping person as well, leaping across the lava. Well, your problems have just been multiplied. Uh, massively. And that's the same with this. Yeah, can I use submarines to seal off the North Atlantic? Who knows? Probably not. Can I cause trouble for your convoys with submarines? Yes. But again, it's all a long war thinking. It's all thinking about a war which is going to last more than a week. It's about thinking things through and seeing what's going to come. It's not always easy, it's not always straightforward, and you don't always make the right decisions. But if you're thinking in terms of one type of war, and a short version of that war, in only, as your sole purpose, focus, and everything else is just being done for image, to give you the image that you have other options, when you don't really believe in them, you will make some really stupid decisions. And the Svaldov class 
would have taken a, a, a supreme advantage of those decisions in the ni in late 1950s, early 1960s. They would have really loved it in the 1970s. As would any other Russian cruiser which happened to find itself out there. But there again, the Russians were making their own stupid decisions by that point, And were focusing in on everything must defend the bastions. Everything must defend the bastions. We must control the bastions to protect the ballistic missile submarines. Okay. Small question. Ballistic missile submarines, they operate by hiding from the enemy, correct? Yes. So, you've created bastions which you are going to patrol and protect from the enemy coming in. Yes. So, you've A, revealed the area where the sub ballistic missile submarines are going to be to the enemy. True. And you've also created a scenario whereby there are these forces going around which are going to be trying to hunt down enemy submarines which are sneaking into attack your ballistic missile submarines which are also going to be trying to hide because they don't want to reveal their position to you or to the enemy because of operational security. So you're going to have to be careful when you're attacking submarines which are hiding and trying to be stealthy and trying to figure out, first of all, whether you're attacking one of your own ballistic missile submarines or whether you're attacking an enemy boat that's trying to sneak in to attack your ballistic missile submarines. It's complicated. Thank you for all the comments. Thank you especially for Frederick. I hope I hope I wasn't hard on you. You you gave me a lot of information, so you basically triggered the whole academic debate where we are sarcastic as second nature, so I'm hoping it wasn't hard on you. Uh thank you for all your comments, from everyone. Hope you enjoyed. I hope you have a good day. Right, I normally would put a question at the end of these videos, but I'm kind of cheating because I've got so many videos coming up and I'm working out questions. But when it comes to Soviet cruiser doctrine, etc., one of the things I'd like people to think about is I am starting to put together the list of video topics for next year. Well, I've got most of the list together. If you go on Patreon, you will find. If you are a patron, you will find all the details there of the list of the, the uh, list of the um, topics for next year's long patrols for your design technology. I'm working through them now, but. And of course, I'm going to be doing the whole Soviet series over Christmas. There are free, uh, free long patrols, free recorded videos, and a live for that. Basically, I suppose what I'm coming back, uh, coming back to is next year I'm going to make is the year of design technology. Next year is going to be looking at the interface of. Technology to create how it, how it evolved into designs that were made, and I kind of want an idea of how deep people want me to go down those rabbit holes. We'll probably find out as we go through the year. I'll probably find out that I'll be aiming too deep or too shallow, and I'll get comments. But I'd like people to give me a heads up in advance what depth they think they want to go. Do they want to go right down to the nuts and bolts decisions of you know, how how they decide how wide the stern is, etc. and all those things by look, thinking about what events they're going to be hosting there. Or, you know, what sort of how they lay out the various bits and pieces on the ship. Or do you want to sort of talk more at level of why are we choosing this gun? Why are we choosing this radar system? Why are we choosing this combination? Anyway. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. I think I have to give big thanks to Ed Stevens, Michael Cooch, and said and, and said to Frederick Miles, but also Ian Walter, sixty-two, Hans Broger, and well, Quizmaster China. You did so many comments. Seriously, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Take care, and yeah, have a nice evening.